If you're a guest with us, we welcome you at First Baptist Church of Lockport. We have been going through a series on Sunday morning um, titled Seven Pillars of a Healthy Church. Seven Pillars of a Healthy Church. Today, we are going to take a closer look at a healthy church is discipleship focused. A healthy church is discipleship focused. We're going to be looking at several selected passages of Scripture, but the main passage of Scripture that I do want us to turn to uh, is Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Uh, anytime discipleship is talked about or preached, I think that's the basis of, of discipleship. It's our starting point. This is where we must first observe what Jesus meant by discipleship. When you've arrived to the text, say word, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Word. Can you please stand as we read from the word of God? We stand out of reverence to God's word. All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, and we pray that you will be able to enlighten us on the subject of discipleship. Very grateful that Brother Tim LaFleur a few weeks ago preached on this very same subject. And God, we are grateful uh, for a church that is pursuing discipleship. Um, God, within this, the four walls of this church and also outside in our community, um, that God, we are desiring to invest in people, to entrust the glorious word and gospel of Jesus Christ to people, to safeguard that gospel. So God, I pray that you will give us a clearer understanding. And God, if we do have the understanding, that you would break our hearts to uh, want, wanting to make disciples or, or God wanting to be disciples. Uh, my prayer is, God, that we are a church that is focused on the depth of ministry. Uh, most importantly, we want our people to be spiritually mature. And God, the breath of the ministry is up to you. So God, cultivate in our hearts a passion for your glory. A passion for you. In your mighty and precious name, God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Several years ago, the Southern Baptist Convention held a survey which they asked multiple pastors, SBC pastors, Southern Baptist pastors, what are the most important ministries in the church today? The results were not surprising. Most pastors said that the ministry of outreach is the most important. Some said evangelism, and others said the worship service on Sunday morning is the most important ministry of the church. And still, others mentioned that it was uh, Sunday school. Sunday school classes is the most important ministry of the church. Saints, all of these things are very important, but it's not the most important and we wonder why so many churches in the SBC church are plateaued or declining. It said 85% of Southern Baptist churches are plateaued or declining. Why? Because prayer is not mentioned and making disciples is not mentioned as the most important ministry within the church. For example... 7% of the pastors mentioned that discipleship was important. Only 7%. They wonder why churches are declining or being plateaued. Only 5% said that prayer was important in the church. Saints, if we really observe this and some stats on the SBC, over 6,000 pastors called the SBC convention, Southern Baptist Convention, annually because they are depressed and willing to step out of the ministry. Over 6,000 a year. Most Southern Baptist churches are without pastors right now. Pastors will go for two years and then leave and go to another church for two years and then leave. Why? Maybe the focus is not on prayer 
and disciple making. Because if we make the focus on prayer and disciple making, then we will see a healthy church. Here's another stat for you. And for those of you who are parents, 88% of children raised in the SBC churches are disengaged and no longer attending churches anymore. 88%. That's a lot. So maybe it's time for us to change our focus in the SBC convention. Now, we could say it's the SBC, but we could say multiple other denominations. Maybe it's time to change our focus and say that our focus should be the most important ministries within the church is disciple making and prayer. Today, I want us to observe four questions about discipleship and disciple making. Four questions that I want us to be able to answer. Okay, so are you with me? We're going to dive into the text. We, we're going to look at several passages of Scripture, and, and we are seeking to, to answer several questions. Question number one, question number one, why is disciple making important? Our brother Tim touched on some of that a few weeks ago. I, I, want, to, I want to go back and, and talk about these things. Why is disciple making important? Question number two, what is disciple making? So, we're saying it is important, but we want to know and define what is disciple making. We want to be clear as to what disciple making really is. Number three, how can we make disciples? So, Christ, you're commanding us to go out and make disciples. We're asking this question. And let's all ask this question. How? How are we supposed to do this? And four, very practical the question is, what does discipleship look like at FBC Lockport? And now let's take it home. Are we doing this? And how are we doing this? And how are you called to be a part of this? Notice with me the first question. Why is disciple making important? Why is disciple making important? Now, I want you to imagine a friend calls. And the friend tells you of this great information, that they just found the cure for AIDS, the remedy for AIDS. And the friend says to you, hey, look, I want you to, to, to get this message out there. What will be your method? Now, I could think of what your method would be. First, you would call the experts in that field, field to make sure that this friend is right. Second, you will call the press um, and let them know that you, you found the cure for AIDS. And third, you will probably turn to social media to get the message out there. But I can tell you this, 2,000 years ago, God himself came to this earth with the greatest message ever, which still is the greatest message ever. And what he did, he didn't call the expert in the field, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and say, hey, I have this. He didn't call the Galilean press to come and, 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 and listen to him speak. What Jesus did was he invested his life in 12 disciples. He, he poured into them. He gave them this message for three years, and he set them loose. Today, we have Christianity. But, but listen to me very carefully. Let's go, let's go back to this friend. We think about this friend and, and, and we're thinking to ourselves, uh, how can we trust what this friend is saying? And, and I want you to understand this because what discipleship really is, is all about relationship. It's all about relationship. So let's go back to this friend. A friend calls you, and suppose a friend wakes you up early in the morning and say, I have this cure. Now, if you don't have a relationship with this person, or you don't trust this person, what would be the first thing you would do, Stephen? The first thing you would do is dismiss what this person is saying. Oh, here he is again, calling me about something. He has the cure for AIDS, whatever. Forget you. I don't care about what you have to say. But if this is a friend you trust, and you have a relationship with, and this friend called you, this is what's going to happen. You will have an urgency to proclaim that message. And this is exactly what Jesus does with discipleship. 
Jesus invested his life three years with the disciples. He included them. He didn't just tell them about the message or show them the message. He involved them in the message. And therefore, Jesus said, go out and share. That's why when we read the book of Acts, the disciples have such a great passion in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus spent three years cultivating that relationship with them. And saints, I want you to observe this and understand this, and you could write this down. A right relationship and trust will birth urgency to the proclamation of a message. A right relationship and trust will birth urgency to the proclamation of the message. Let me give you a perfect example of this. For those of you as believers, when you find that you have broken fellowship or you're out of fellowship, right word, you're, 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 your fellowship is hindered with the Lord because of sin or whatever, you, you find that you don't have a desire, an urgency to make disciples or share Christ or evangelize, right? Why, why is that? Because your fellowship is hindered. So there's not an urgency to sharing and proclaiming the message. There's not an urgency to making disciples. But when your fellowship with the Lord is strong and there is a trust and you understand what's going on, then there is a great passion to sharing the glorious gospel and making disciples. Now, I want you to see this because this is from Confucius. Confucius was confused about a lot of things, including the way to God. But after all, it seems like Confucius wasn't confused about everything. And this is what Confucius said. He said, tell me, and I will forget. Show me, and I will remember. Involve me, and I will understand. Do you notice what discipleship is? It is involving people. That's exactly what Jesus did. He involved people with the gospel and in the gospel. And we should do the same thing. Notice with me in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. After Jesus' resurrection, he commissioned his disciple on a great task. And the task was to go, to evangelize, to baptize, to teach, but also to make disciples. But notice with me very carefully as you're looking in the text. And Brother Tim alluded to that. I want to go a little deeper into it. Okay, So notice very carefully. There are four action words. And the four action words we can see is go. Another action word is baptize. Another action word is teach. And then there is another action word in our English translation, which is make disciples. In the original language, this is read a little different. There is actually one key verb. It's an imperative verb. And that is to make disciples. And the other words that we see, such as go, baptize, and teach, they're all participles. Now, in the original language in Greek, a participle often operates of functions like an adverb. Let me give you a perfect example of that. I am quickly running to the store. What is the verb in that sentence? The verb is running. What is the adverb? Quickly. So quickly modifies the verb running. In this passage of scripture, the verb is making disciples. Going, baptizing, and teaching are kind of like adverbs. They are modifying the main verb. And this is how it's, we should read this. As you are going, make disciples. As you are baptizing, make disciples. As you are teaching, make disciples. What is the emphasis? The emphasis is making disciples. Now, you might be saying to me, Brother Kevin, okay, what's the point of all of this? Let me tell you how Christianity have gotten this completely messed up. Here's application. How can you evangelize without making disciples? Here it is. By leading someone through a sinner's prayer and thinking that will save them. By focusing only on someone being converted but not being discipled. By saying to someone, repeat after me and go your way and I'll see you in heaven, brother, and we're fine with it. That's not what Jesus is saying. 
Evangelism and the end goal of evangelism is always to make disciples. So we sit down, we share Christ with people, hoping that they will get the glorious gospel. And our desire is to walk alongside of them, helping them, teaching them to understand more about Jesus Christ. But what about baptism? How can we get baptism completely messed up? But we do this, especially in the SBC church. You know, most Southern Baptist churches, we're just concerned about baptism. As a matter of fact, the SBC at times will give you certificates for having the most baptism in the convention. So some churches will get kids as young as five, three, four to be baptized and say, we have baptized about 15 children only this week. Praise the Lord. What is the end goal? The end goal is just getting children to be baptized or getting people to be baptized without Brother Randy helping them to understand what it means to be a disciple. You see what baptism can be without discipleship? The centerpiece of all of this is discipleship. And that's why, for example, there's, there's several churches today are bringing all kinds of stuff. Like one church has this huge fire truck to entertain children. And what they would do is they'll get the fire truck to be outside and say, kids, which do you want to be baptized? Now, what kid would say no to that? I want to be baptized. I'm not even a kid. Let's do it again. Right? But, but really, is, is that what Jesus is saying? Jesus is saying to, to disciple people. And, and saying, I am so blessed because in multiple of our discipleship groups, and we had several of our parents up there, and, and I hope you're not embarrassed by me saying this, Krista and Greg, they got saved, they got discipled, and then they understood the importance of discipleship, importance of baptize, baptism, believer's baptism, and then they were baptized. We had Aaron, the same thing. Uh, Aaron got saved, Aaron got discipled, understood the importance of discipleship, and then got baptized. He's not doing it because of a church or because of you, because of anything else. They're doing it because it's a mandate in Scripture. That's what we want people to understand. Now, what about teaching? How can we teach wrongly? And this is how we can do it, is just thinking we are imparting information. Well, I, I am the scholar that's going to give you all the information. Here is some great information. And when I'm done with giving you all this information, applaud me and tell me how awesome I am. That's messed up. When we teach, we should always desire to teach and hope that people get what it means to serve God and love God and worship God. We teach with a view of discipleship, in the context of discipleship. We want people to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And it's not about us. It's not about how eloquent we can be. We teach and we ask Holy Spirit, move in the lives of people so they can get the glorious gospel, they can get your word, they can live for you. But you know, the problem is, is how some translation translate this. And I want you to see this. I have two translations up there for you to see. And see the emphasis. In the ESV, it says, make disciples, right? In the original language, this is the word. Make disciples. That's the word that stands out. But in the King James translation, this is how it translates. Instead of saying make disciples, it says this. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. The key word is missing. What about making disciples? So you mean to tell me, King James, all I have to do is teach? The original language, what Jesus is really saying is this. Yeah, teaching is important, but the imperative verb is missing. And that is to make disciples. Why is it important? Because it was Jesus' strategy. It was Jesus' strategy. Saints, listen to me very carefully. I want you to understand that the lack of making disciples will undermine everything that we do in the church today. Did, did you get this? It is the centerpiece of what we do, the cornerstone of our ministries. And if we're not focused on making disciples and all we're focused on is baptizing, and, and, and don't get me wrong, baptism is important. I don't want you to think I'm undermining baptism, but in its right context. Teaching is important, but in its right context. Evangelism is important, but in its right context. So if we take discipleship out of the picture, we're messed up. The church will be messed up. Now, 
I hope you're asking this question. Okay, we see the importance from Matthew 28. We see the importance. Now, now please help me understand what is disciple making. Okay, now, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take it one step at a time. I want to think systematically, and let's, one step at a time. First, let's define what a disciple is. So this is the second question. What is disciple making? But we're defining what is a disciple. The word disciple means a learner or a student. That's what it means. And even in our secular world, we have that. For those of you who are Star Wars fan, uh, you know of Luke Skywalker and, is it Yoda? Yoda. Right, guy? I know you're a big fan. There you go. Yoda. Right? So what you have is you have Luke Skywalker, who is the disciple. Yoda, who is the one who is discipling, the discipler. That's the relationship that they have. That Yoda invested in Luke Skywalker, taught him everything that he knows. So what we find in Christianity is the same thing. There, there's a disciple and then there is a discipler. And the disciple is one who learns. Now, this is often what many Christians do. What they will do is they'll get into scripture and they will say, Matt, a disciple and a Christian are two different things. And I've heard this multiple times. And this is what they're saying, Chad. They're saying a disciple is one who is a great Christian. He is a Sunday school teacher. He is one who preaches the gospel. He is the Awana teacher that studies the word. That's a disciple. One that is strong in Christ. But a Christian is, is one that is really not a strong believer. A Christian is one who just said the prayer and who is dormant in their lives and, and really not following Christ the way they ought to. So, so listen to me very carefully. And if that's you in this room, I first have to define what a disciple is. Because if you're thinking a disciple and a Christian are two different things, you are wrong. Because we have to observe what Jesus said. The word disciple is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible, it is the word designated for a believer. The word Christian is only mentioned three times in the Bible. As a matter of fact, the first time the word was used was in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And I want you to see that for yourself. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. When you arrive to the text, say word. Notice what the text mentions. And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Do you see? So disciples are Christians. They're, it's, not, it's not a difference. We can't just place them in different categories. As a matter of fact, the word Christian was used as a derogatory term to make fun of the Christians or the disciples. And so what they would do is they would call them little Christ. The other time it's used, it's mentioned in the book of Acts in chapter 26 when King Agrippa told Paul, are you trying to convince me to be a Christian, Paul? And then later on, it, it mentions in the text, Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 16, Peter then embraced the word and said, even if they're calling you a Christian, embrace it. Suffer for Christ. So first, let's understand, if you are a believer today, you are a disciple. Do not say, well, I'm a Christian, Brother Kevin. I don't have to make disciples. That's for y'all to do. That's for the preacher to do. That's for the Sunday school teacher to do. Do you want a teacher to do? Not me. Man, I just got my ticket to go to heaven, and that's fine. I'm fine with it. Listen to me. That's not in Scripture. If you're a believer, you're called to be a disciple. So, with that said, what is disciple making? Disciple making, and this is how I define disciple making. Disciple making is entrusting God's word and gospel to faithful disciples who will replicate the process. Disciple making is entrusting God's word and the gospel to faithful disciples who will replicate the process. Now, where are you getting this from, Kevin? I'm glad you asked. I want you to see in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. Okay? Brother Tim mentioned this last 
two weeks ago. I want you to see it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. When you've arrived at the text, say word. Word. Amen. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now, saints, listen to me very carefully and notice this. Matthew 28, 18 to 20 was Jesus' last command to his disciples, which should be our first concern. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2 is one of Paul's last commands to his faithful disciple, Timothy. Right after Paul wrote this book, he was killed. Both of them, before they died, Understood the importance of disciple making. So Paul is writing to Timothy and pleading with Timothy to invest and entrust the gospel and God's word to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Well, let's observe this definition very carefully. The first thing I want you to observe is the word entrust. Do you see the word entrust in this text? By far, one of the most, are you listening? I want you to listen to this. I want you to underline this word. That word entrust. I know it's your Bible. It's okay. If you underline this word, see this. The word entrust is by far one of the most powerful words in the New Testament. The, the word carries the idea of depositing something for valuable safe keeping. The best thing I can do to illustrate this point to you or for you is, is this. When you go to a bank after you get your check on Friday or whatever day you get your check, you go to the bank and you deposit this check. When you deposit this check, the teller then gives you a receipt. Oftentimes, and hopefully you don't do this, but some people like to do this. They throw the receipt away. They never really check on the account to make sure their money is in the account or the interest is growing. So, so what, what this really is, is when you deposit the check, you receive the receipt. You save the receipt. You safeguard that money in the account. You go online and check to see if that money is there. You, you, you also check to see if the interest is growing. So, so what you're doing is you deposit the check, but you're safeguarding the check. And what Jesus and Paul is saying, and what Paul is saying in this text, is the gospel, when it was entrusted, this is what we're called to do. It is a valuable deposit. That when we share the gospel to people, and people get saved, we want to safeguard the gospel in the lives of people. We don't say to them, well, you're a savior, you're a convert, leave me alone and go. What you say is, how can I safeguard that gospel? And the way we do it in discipleship is walking with that person, praying for that person, teaching that person, involving that person in our lives so they could see the gospel moving in us. You know, I've learned that there are three things that are eternal. Are you listening? Listen to this. Three things that are eternal. God, his word, and the souls of man. Did you hear that? God, his word, and the souls of men. And what we do, we are so busy in America. We are so busy in our lives that we are saying, who cares about the souls of men? We could safeguard our money in the bank account, but that will go away. What about someone that is loving Jesus and they need you to safeguard the gospel in their lives? How are you making disciples? That's eternal. A soul is eternal. It's amazing what Paul is saying in this text. is not only the word entrust, but I want you to observe a second phrase in this text. Observe with me very carefully. Observe the spiritual multiplication mentioned in this text. Uh, 2 Timothy is a very powerful passage of scripture, but notice the four generations. I don't want you to miss this. Because if, if you are just meeting up for a Bible study and you're not replicating, that's not discipleship. The end goal of discipleship is to see someone grow in Christ and then replicate what they have learned. 
reproduce what they have learned. Notice the four generations in this text. Paul, Timothy, faithful men, and Jake, others. Wow. Paul, the gospel went to Paul. Paul entrusted the gospel to Timothy. Timothy is called to entrust that to other men and faithful men. And then faithful men are called to entrust that to others. Saints, I want you to get this picture. In Jerusalem, there are two bodies of water. The Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. One is vibrant, the other one is dead. Guess which one's dead? There's a reason why the Dead Sea is called dead. The Sea of Galilee has many rivers flowing into it. And to the south of the Sea of Galilee, there is the Jordan River. By far one of the most healthy rivers in that time, or still is today, and, and, and vibrant rivers. But that river then flows into the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, on the other hand, has no outlet. It's called the Dead Sea for a reason. There are no living organisms in the Dead Sea. It is so salty. And when you go into the Dead Sea, from what people said, you're not able to sink. All you do is float. Doesn't matter how fat you are, how big you are, you will float in the Dead Sea, dude. This is how it is. And there's a reason why. It is dead. It is not flowing into something else. Listen to me very carefully. There's a great concept. This is what I want you to get. We should be like the Sea of Galilee. People are flowing into us, and we are flowing into others. But there are so many people and Christians who are like the Dead Sea. They come and listen to sermons. They have so much information, but yet they're not giving any information to others. You're like the Dead Sea. And God didn't create you to be like the Dead Sea. God created you to give and disciple others. C.S. Lewis likened the church of Jesus Christ as a fleet of ship, sheep, ships sailing in information. So we are like a fleet of ships sailing with information. Sarah, we have all the information we need, but yet we are not investing and entrusting that information to others. I like what the Apostle Paul said. He stated in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, and he says, Brothers, join me in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. It is important that we get this, that the success of our Christian life is connected to how well we walk with others. We're not meant to be like the Lone Ranger. We're meant to walk with other Christians together. This picture of discipleship is all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament, Brother Kevin. There is this discipleship relationship. So, so Moses received from the Lord. Moses then gave to Joshua. So I want you to see of discipleship relationships. Old Testament as well as New Testament. I have it up there for you to see. Moses and Joshua. Joshua. Joshua was called in the Hebrew word Sarat of Moses, which means his disciple. He was his assistant. He learned from Moses. He ministered with Moses. What about Elijah and Elisha? Elisha was the disciple of Elijah. He said he wanted a double portion of Elijah's spirit. He left everything to follow Elijah so he could learn what it meant to walk with God. Eli and Samuel. Samuel learned everything from Eli. What about in the New Testament? John the Baptist and the 12 disciples. John the Baptist poured his life into 12 disciples or poured his life into several disciples. And then we see Jesus and the 12 disciples. Three years, Jesus poured his life into 12. And Brother Larry, he even brought it down to three. He spent a lot of time with Peter, James, and John. Then we find Barnabas and Paul. There's a discipleship relationship. When all the other Christians were afraid of Paul, Barnabas, the son of encourager, went to Paul and encouraged him and poured into him. They did ministry together. And then we find Paul, by far one of the greatest disciple makers in the Bible. When you read the New Testament, Paul perhaps 
discipled over 35 men. Paul and Timothy, we find in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, he called them his son in the faith. This is not foreign, guys. This is the method that God has used in the Old Testament, and it's the method that he's using right now. Old Testament, New Testament, right now. Notice the third question. How can we make disciples? Are you asking this question? But now we've observed, why is discipleship important? What is disciples making? Now we want to understand, how are we called to make disciples? Well, it's very easy. All we have to do is observe Jesus. We don't have to invent new methods. Discipleship classes or call whatever we want to call it. All we have to do is observe Jesus and what he did. Now, I think there are five things that I want us to observe. Five strategies in Jesus' making disciples. I want you to see this very carefully. It's up there for you to see. What did Jesus do with his disciples? He prayed for his disciples. You find faithful men who will be able to teach others also, and then what you do is you pray with them. But you also teach them how to pray. In Matthew chapter 6, we see that Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. And he prayed for them in John chapter 17. What else did Jesus do? He taught his disciples God's word. Jesus is always teaching them about God's word. Matthew chapter 5 through chapter 7, Jesus is constantly teaching his disciples about what God's word means. In Jesus' time, we had the Pharisees and Sadducees who were constantly uh, teaching people about traditions. And Jesus said, don't listen to them. Listen to the word of God. In Luke chapter 24, verse 27, I love this passage of scripture. It says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all scriptures the things concerning himself. What was Jesus doing? Teaching his disciples about the word of God. What else? Jesus taught his disciples. Jesus taught his disciples about God. Saints, that's throughout the gospel. He's teaching them about God's faithfulness, God's mercy, God's kindness. Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, about God who is the heavenly Father. Jesus was always teaching about God. Another element that I see or strategy that Jesus did with his disciples, Jesus did ministry with his disciples. So it's not just meeting up for an hour or two, but including people you're pouring your life into to do ministry with you. Whether it is you're teaching Awana together, or you're cleaning the church together, or you're evangelizing together, or you're involved in serving someone in your community together, involve people in ministry with you. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He served with them. And finally, this is what I love. Jesus lived life with his disciples. He was always with them, Michelle. He laughed with them. He cried. He prayed. He did everything with them. He lived life with his disciples. So we don't have to invent a new will. We just have to follow Jesus' method. How can we do this? We pour into people the same way that Jesus poured into others, into his own disciples. And finally, finally, I want us to observe this question. What does discipleship look like at FBC Lockport? What does it look like at FBC Lockport? I, I could tell you this. My passion is to make disciples. And I know several of you who have been there from the moment I got there, maybe you're tired of hearing the same thing over and over again. But man, I believe that if we are a disciple-making church, which I think we are, we're going to see the spiritual maturity of our church just go up. I firmly believe this. Brother Tim said that many churches are a, uh, uh, an inch deep but a mile wide. And for us, what we're saying is, we want to focus on the depth of the ministry, which is preaching. Our Sunday school teachers teach. 
making disciples, praying. We want to focus on the depth of the ministry at FBC Lockport and let God focus on the breadth of the ministry. God, if you want to bless us with more people, do it. If you want us to have five, six services, you do it. We're not going to focus on these things. We're not going to focus on programs. We're going to focus on the depth of the ministry. So we want people's spirituality to rise. We want people to be mature. That's what we're called to do. So, so you, might be, you might be tempted to, to go to other churches and have all those lights and actions and whatever. I can tell you that's not going to be us. Our, our desire is to make disciples. You might say, well, other churches have more programs. Well, free, feel free to go. But for us, we are going to make disciples. Disciples and emphasize on making disciples. Saints, I want you to observe this. This is for you to keep us accountable at FBC Lockport. Let's keep each other accountable. Here are all the four domains of where we are making disciples, okay? Three out of the four have elements of discipleship, but not fully, okay? So notice very carefully in our corporate worship service. Anytime a pastor is going to come to preach, we want them to preach and teach with the intention of making disciples. We want to teach to see you grow in Christ. Our Sunday Bible study, which is the second domain, I am grateful and so amazed at the caliber of teachers we have in this church that are teaching Every Sunday morning and studying, I have conversations with them on how they are diving into the text week by week. And I could tell you, you are blessed to have Sunday Bible teachers and substitute teachers that are teachers that love you and pray for you and desire that you will mature in the faith. So we want to encourage our Bible study teachers to keep on teaching to make disciples. Then we have small groups where people are meeting up in their homes and they're inviting lost people to come and be a part of that. Where they're also including other people from the church to be a part of that for the purpose of fellowship and evangelism and also discipling the believers. And we encourage that. Share Christ. Live life together. And finally, the most important discipleship group that we have, it is our e-group. Well, are you just trying to be fancy, Kevin? But well, Tim calls it D-group. Why are you calling it e-group? Here's the reason why. Because of the word entrusting. Each and every one of our discipleship groups are entrusting groups. I encourage them to do this. Not just sit and have a Bible study, but entrust the word and the gospel. Walk alongside those people. So what we have, we have several groups where they're meeting up, women with women and men with men. Sometimes two to five people in a group. They're meeting up. They're learning about the word of God. And there are several things that we do in this group. I want you to observe and understand what we are doing, following Jesus' method. One, we encourage each and every one of the people who are going through this to do this, to read or have a Bible reading plan. Whether they read through the entire Bible in a year, their own personal time, they're reading through the Bible, or read just through a book of the Bible over and over and over again. We want them to spend time in the Word. Prayer. We spend time praying for those we are discipling, but we always also encourage the ones we are discipling to pray. So in those discipleship groups, we spend time praying for each other. Sometimes, saints, I'll be honest with you, it is by far one of the most heartfelt prayers in those small accountability or e-groups and trusting groups. To see a brother who's struggling with something and he mentions it. Or I am struggling with something and I mention it to the people in the group. And we take time and we weep and we seek God's face together. You can't do this in the corporate worship. You cannot do this in your Sunday Bible study. And you cannot do this in a small group. In an e-group, you can. Another element of that group is that we encourage people to, to learn about God. To learn about doctrines. To learn about who God is. God's character, 
God is faithful in love. The work of God in salvation, that he justifies us, he sanctifies us, he glorifies us. How can we know this? If no one is teaching us. So our e-group leaders are actually teaching people these things. So one of the things that we do is we go through Wayne Grudem's systematic theology. And several of our groups, that's what they're doing. And they're learning about doctrines. What is the Bible? Who is God? Who is Christ? What is the Trinity? You have someone walking with you and teaching you and you're asking questions. It's amazing. There's also another small book that we use, which is a condensed version of Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology, which is called 20 Basic Beliefs. Very easy to read, but it talks about the doctrines of God. Listen, Jesus taught his disciples about God. And therefore, in our discipleship group or in trusting group, we must learn about God. The next element of what we do in our e-group is that we learn how to interpret Scripture. Listen to me very carefully. Are you listening? We are not about you meeting up with someone, you read a passage of Scripture, and then you say, well, Archie, tell me what it means to you. <laughs> well, Ms. Brenda, tell me what the Scripture means to you. Here's the problem with that. If that's what we do, we're going to have all different opinions do I really care what it means to me or do I first care what, it, what Christ is saying? What is Christ saying in this text? And then I could take it and apply it to my life. So if we don't know how to interpret scripture, then there's all kinds of heresies and error that we can breed in those groups. So what we do is we teach people how to interpret scripture, how to understand context within scripture. There are several materials that we use, and several of our discipleship groups, they have used this. So we, we do one, how to read the Bible for all it's worth. It teaches you how to interpret Scripture. Another one that we use, which is very simple, uh, live by the book, which, which teaches you how to interpret Scripture. And some of our ladies are going through inductive Bible study by K. Arthur. It teaches you how to interpret Scripture. So if Jesus walked with his disciples and taught them how to interpret scripture, we in the e-group must teach people how to interpret scripture. Don't get me wrong. Application is very important. We can talk about what God is doing in, with his word in our lives, yes. But we want the right context first. Here's another thing we must do. Do ministry together in those e-groups. In those e-groups, we, we got to involve ourselves in doing ministry with one another. If we have an e-group and, man, we're involved in a particular ministry, invite them to come. If we're evangelizing someone in our neighborhood and we have an e-group, invite them to come and meet those people. Show them how ministry is done. And finally, involve them in your lives. Listen, people are very messy. They are. You know, one of the things I don't like when I go to Subway, I don't get anymore, is a meatball sub. And here's the reason why I don't get a meatball sub. It is messy. But what God has done, a lot of people could be like a meatball sub, dude. But they're just very messy. They have all kinds of stuff in their lives and all what's going on in the e-group, everything comes out. And guess what? If you can be patient and love people and walk them, walk with them, Involve them in your lives. You tell them, come over and have supper with you. Do, go on vacations together. They're your friends. Oftentimes, in discipleship relationship, what we do is we say to them, well, let's meet up at 1 o'clock at this time, that time, and that's it. Go home, I go home, that's it. You have to safeguard the gospel so you involve them. You, you show them your dynamics with your family, how you love your wife, how you treat your children. You allow them to see all your mess-ups. Involve them. Why is discipleship so important? I have a final thing for you to see up there. Notice the contrast between someone personally seeing one person come to know the Lord every day for a year as compared to one investing in the same two people for an entire year. 
Are you able to see this? So one evangelist evangelizes every day and leads someone to Christ every day. But we have 365. A discipler meet up with two people, disciple them for one year. Doing exactly what I just mentioned, following Jesus' method, for one year, pours his life into that person. It's two. After two years, the evangelist seems to be doing really good. 730 people. The discipler, only four. After four years, 1,460. The evangelist, the discipler, 16. Ten years, 3,650. The discipler, only 512. He's not going to catch up, right? Well, let's see. Verse 12, I'm sorry, 12th year, 4,380. The discipler, he's catching up, 4,096. 15 years, 5,475. The discipler, 32,768. 16 years, 5,840. The discipler, 65,000. 536. Does it work? Yes, it works. The first couple of years, it might look like, huh, nothing is happening. But that was Jesus' strategy, guys. Do you notice that? He poured his life into 12 disciples and changed the world forever. Remember this. Discipleship is about relationship. When people know that they trust you and love you and have a relationship with you, there will be an urgency in them proclaiming that message. So it's important to involve them in your lives, to, to show them the importance of the gospel, to show them your love for Jesus, to show them your struggles, to show them your desire to pursue Christ. And one guy asked me this question. He said, well, well, well Kevin, don't you think that, that you don't have a correct view on discipleship and that really what we should be discipling is just our children? And I said, yes, brother. That's the first group of people that we should be discipling, our family. You are 110% right in saying we should be discipling our children. Because guess what? They're the ones who see us on a consistent basis. We're called to pour, for, pour first into our family's life. But, but this is the question I ask him. What about the young men and women who do not know how to disciple their children? What do we do about that? Are we not called to disciple them so that they can disciple their children? Both are important. Definitely your children are more important that you are called to disciple them and disciple your spouse. But don't forget the ministry of discipling other men and women to disciple others. You know, first, this is what we do. Anytime we hear about discipleship and pastor talk about more work, we think, ah, I don't have time. Kevin, uh, have you been to my home? My kids have all kinds of sports. My children are involved in all kinds of stuff. I, I work all the time, and I have to do this, I have to do that, I have to do this. What do you mean, do something else? Well, first of all, listen very carefully. I'm not asking you to do anything. Jesus is asking you to do something. Jesus said to go out and make disciples. But you will find your life will be more meaningful if you're discipling your children and your family first, and also discipling others to disciple others. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word in Scripture as Jesus called for us to go out and make disciples. In 2 Timothy 2.2, we see the great passage of Scripture of making disciples. God, we thank you for the leaders in this church that are, God, constantly pouring their lives into others um, and, and, and all the different e-groups that we have going on, Father. We, we don't have them just for fashion or to praise that we have E-groups, or D-groups, or C-groups, or F-groups. <laughs> Whatever we want to call them, as long as we are following Jesus' methods, or method, Jesus' strategies, how can we ever deny His strategy? We can call it programs. We can, we can call it whatever we want to call it. But this is what our Lord and Savior did. He poured his life into others. He discipled. 
This is what Paul did. Peter did. Barnabas did. Timothy and all the other disciples in the early church discipled. So let us do this. To glorify your name. Exalt your name. In your mighty and precious name. Amen. Please stand.